Good morning, everybody. Oh, <clears throat> a bit of a frog in my throat. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Arise with me, Sally Goodwin. Welcome, 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 everyone. It is so good to see you all this morning. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Welcome to Arise with Sally Goodwin. It is good to see you all this morning. Again, I feel like I say welcome a thousand times sometimes in the morning, but this live takes a while to begin. And then every time I think it started and then it sort of stops and starts again and I'm never a hundred percent sure. So if I if you hear me say it a million times, good morning, joyful Jesse, lovely to see you. Good morning, Renil Way, lovely to have you on. Wonderful, wonderful people. Good morning, magnificent Martha, all the way from Amanus. It's just amazing. Good morning. I'm just so thankful for the people who join me from all over the place. Honestly, I really am. And um, the ticket sales, oh my goodness, God is so good, people. God is so good. The ticket sales for this event on the 19th of August, they are selling like hotcakes. Good morning, beautiful Bridget. Good morning, heroic Hilda. Good morning, amazing Estralita. Welcome everybody, welcome, welcome. Good morning, Julie, lovely to have you on my friend. So the ticket sales for this event on the 19th of August for the book launch, they are selling like hot cakes. Good morning, Conrad. <laughs> it is so wonderful to have you on. Never mind that you, it's good to be allowed on. Of course you're allowed on. It is amazing to have a courageous man like yourself who is unafraid to boldly watch these broadcasts amongst all of these powerful women of God. So thank you for being so courageous and unafraid to place your name in the comments with boldness and courage, a true Joshua or true Caleb, whichever you would prefer to be. So yes, welcome everybody. Um, so I've just, I'm so excited. God is so good. Uh, the tickets for the launch, for the book launch, for my book launch, for this event, which is, yes, it is my book that has been launched and it is uh, my my event to a degree, um, but it is very much God's, it is very much God's event. Good morning, Halette. Wonderful to have you on, my friends. Um, so good to see you here this morning. These, the tickets are selling like hotcakes. The ticket sales have exceeded my expectations. I just, I just want you all to know that those of you who are praying, who are covering me and my family, who are covering this, good morning, beautiful Bertha, who are covering this event, who are interceding and praying, please, thank you so much. Do not stop praying. Do not stop interceding. Um, the ticket sales they are selling every single day. I sell more tickets. It is just amazing. Um, it's just absolutely incredible. Please also know that it is not a women's only event. Um, obviously, it will be very much a majority women. Um, that is just the nature of the event is going to be majority women. Uh, but there are uh, men who are coming. Um, they will be in the minority, but there are some courageous men who are coming. My husband will be there. He wouldn't miss it for anything. Good morning, Jolene. Wonderful to have you on this morning, my friend. Lovely to see you. Um, my husband will be there representing the male side of the equation. Um, he wouldn't miss it for the world. Thank you, beautiful Bertha. If you... If my messages resonate with you, good morning, Karen. Lovely to see you, my friend. Please like and share. I really appreciate the people who like and share these messages. Um, so, yes, please, um, men are welcome. Um, it's not a women's only event. Uh, men won't be stopped at the door and turned away. Um, if you want to bring your husbands or your sons or your whomever, you know, um, women need men who support them in the kingdom. 
and um, we need to walk alongside men. Uh, the message that I preach and the message that I release is not a um, secular feminist message of you know women who need to oppress men in order to get ahead. It is a message of women and men who need to walk equally um, side by side, shoulder to shoulder to take the kingdom of God forward, to move the body of Christ forward, to prepare the bride of Christ for the coming of the bridegroom. So men are welcome. Um, they will be in the minority, I do know that, but they are welcome. Uh, so yes, but it's just amazing. The people who are booking tickets, um, just I, I don't even know where they're all coming from, but the tickets are selling fast. They are selling fast and it is, we are, what is the date today? Let us double check our dates today. It is the 23rd of June, uh, 2023, and it is the 4th of Tammuz, 5783. So it is the 23rd of June. We still have two months to go, um, just under two months until the event, and already the tickets are selling. And please, again, please, I want to just say this once again, that if whether you if you need to book your ticket, message me or email me. Good morning, Anisha. Message me or email me to book your ticket. It doesn't matter if you cannot pay immediately. Even if you can only pay if at the end of this month or at the end of July. You know, whether you can whether you have to wait for payday at the end of this month, whether you need to wait for payday at the end of July, that is fine. The event is on the 19th of August. As long as I have received payment by the end of July, you know, that's fine. Um, so please don't not book because you don't have the money right now. Please book your ticket. Um, if email me, message me. You will get reminders closer to the time if you haven't made payment yet. So don't stress about that. Don't wait and not book because there's a very good chance that there won't be seats available um, the way the tickets are selling. So book your tickets. Um, you know, and I will, um, I will write, put your name down, you will have a ticket booked, and then the, um, you can make payments when, when payday comes around. So, be that the end of this month, be that the end of next month. So, please don't be waiting for money. Um, and, um, and yes, let, let's, don't let money stop us from, and I know there are people who have booked tickets and they have told me that they are standing in faith for the money to pay for it and we stand in faith with you, you know, so please do not let that hold you back. Um, this is a faith event. God is, God has spoken to me about birthing. God has spoken to me about breakthrough. God has spoken to me about awakening. Those are the three, the three areas that he has spoken to me that he is bringing uh, on that, on that day. And it's not because of me specifically, it's not because, but it's because of the people that he will have in that room. Women who have pioneered, women who have been forerunners, women who have, you know, gone ahead and led the foundation foundation, women who who have done incredible things for God and have create, will have are bringing and will create an atmosphere that you get to push in, press in, and then break through or birth or awaken to whatever it is that God wants you to step into. It is it is a an Esther four fourteen moment. It is a time where you get to step into what you have been born for, what your purpose is, what your destiny is, what your calling is. There will be women there who will be able to minister to you. There will. Be be, you know, it, it, it is, I don't know exactly what the day is going to look like yet. I'm just being honest with you because, uh, because I'm praying into that still and I know there will be a book launch and there will be worship and there will be, um, I will be speaking and, and beautiful, incredibly powerful, amazing Rose Rhoda will be hosting the event. She will be the MC, so she will be, you know, making sure everything flows and, um, and there will be prophecy and there will be all of those things. I know that there will be all of those things, what they will all look like exactly and how that will all fit together exactly. I'm not a hundred percent sure because I am leaving that to the Holy Spirit, um, and he, he, the Holy Spirit likes to, 
uh, have his own way in these things and I like him to have his own way in these things so he doesn't like me to be over prepared because then I like to control things <laughs> and that is never a good thing so just come expectant really put your faith like put your faith in this not in me or in Rose or in anybody else but in God that 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 this is something that this is a divine appointment that this is a divine appointment for you on this day. Don't worry about anybody else who's going to be there. Don't worry about where it is. Please, please, can I just say something to my Southern Suburbs ladies, and there are many, many of you coming. And let me tell you, I have ladies coming from the deep South, the deep South. So there's no excuse. It is not far. On a Saturday morning when there is very little traffic, it is not far. I have ladies coming from Hermanus. I have ladies coming from Grayton. I have ladies coming from further than the southern suburbs. Let's get over our Cape Townian issue of if it's longer than takes longer than 15 minutes to drive there, it's too far. Okay. But make in your in your mind, set your faith for this for, for an expectation that this is a divine appointment. Good morning, Candace. I know you are my friend because you are always expecting for God to move for you. And that's why he does such incredible things in your life because you come with an open heart and such high expectations of him. And that is just amazing. And that is exactly it. Come expectant. Expect God to move. Expect him to show up. Expect him to do something. Expect birthing. Expect breakthrough. Expect awakening. And God will meet you there. He will meet you in your expectation he will meet you in your faith he will meet you there come expectant just know that there are people praying I will be fasting they are just like there is so much going into prayer going into this event not for anything other than that all of you will experience everything that God has for you there good morning good morning good morning <laughs> welcome everybody okay now this morning, we are speaking about Tammuz, the month of Tammuz. We are in the month of Tammuz. We are in this incredible month where we know that we are going to enter into this, this space where we step into this period of time where we feel as though we enter into this almost a birthing canal where there is this period, this prophetic period that comes around every year Good morning, Dawn. Lovely to have you on. Um, and for those of us who already feel like we've been in this constricted period, for those of us, wonderful Karen, just message me or email me the names and I will put you on the list. Um, for those of us who already feel like we've been pressed in, hemmed in, constricted, the thought of going through a further period of constriction is like, oh my goodness, really, is there still more to come? But we need to see it through the eyes of convergence. We need to see it as this is more than just a birthing thing. This is a convergence. This is when you come out on the other end. You need to be prepared. You need to be awake. You need to be ready so that it is not destructive but it is actually something that propels you forward, that accelerates you forward. Because if you think of the rivers converging together, as we've spoken about before, if you think of when rivers converge together, the deluge that happens after that, it is, yes, it, is, it can be incredibly destructive if you are not prepared, if you are not awake. But you need to think also of the power behind those that that convergence of water good morning radiant rachel lovely to have you on think about the the power behind that convergence of water that there is such power behind it that it propels everything forward it accelerates everything that is in its path it elevates things it takes things to another level things that were on street level are elevated up and think of that in terms of where you are, that you will come out of the season and you will be propelled, you will be elevated, you will be accelerated. Good morning, Tessa. If you are prepared, if you are awake, if you are ready for what God has for you. 
So part of this, part of the month of Tammuz, part of what we speak about during the month of Tammuz is covenant. Covenant, we speak about worship. We speak about guarding our hearts and our eyes. We speak about worshiping in spirit and truth. We speak about, we've been speaking about the fire of intimacy, the fire of holiness, the fire of righteousness for this warrior bride, this warrior bride that Jesus is coming back for. And on Wednesday, I spoke about this fire of intimacy and I spoke about how when Jesus spoke to the church in Ephesus, he spoke about them de deserting their first love. And so we're going to carry on from that and we're going to speak this morning we're going to touch very briefly on the book of Philemon and we're going to speak this morning about covenant because covenant, covenanting with God is what stops us from deserting our first love. Covenanting with God, walking through the fire of intimacy and aligning ourselves covenantly with God is what stops us from walking away from our first love. It's what stops us from deserting him. And where we go in the scriptures over this particular time, when we speak about covenant alignment, the scriptures that are often quoted over this time is Song of Songs. The scripture that is often quoted over this time is Song of Songs. Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 2 to 12. Now, I want us to remember again, because we I always like to remember things in context here. Context is very important when we read the scriptures. That Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, whatever you would like to call it, depending on what translation you're reading, and all of those good things, is a book in the Bible, as we all know, that was apparently written by Solomon as a sort of a love letter to one of his wives, one of his concubines. Nobody is 100% sure. So it was written as a love letter, um, apparently by Solomon. It's not 100% definitely known as that it was written by Solomon, but it is, um, there is enough evidence for people to assume that it was written by Solomon. But it has been taken, so it was written by Solomon as a love letter, apparently, to one of his brides, one of his concubines, etc. So that's, that's the, the, the context of the story, is a letter that was written, but it was included in the canon of scripture. And so we take it as that, as a con in the context, that it was written by Solomon for this reason. Solomon didn't write it necessarily as a prophetic declaration of anything else. He didn't, good morning, Rene, please don't apologize, <laughs> really. Um, the, Solomon didn't, you know, when Solomon wrote the love letter, if it was Solomon that wrote the love letter, it, he didn't write it as a prophetic declaration of anything else. He wrote it as a love letter to his con one of his concubines or one of his brides, one of his many, 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 many wives. Um, and that was what it was written. That was, it was written in aid of that. However, it was included in the canon of scripture. And there are many people who have disputed or wondered why it was included. But when we look at it today, we can see through, and, it's, and not just today, but over centuries of people looking at the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, we can see that it can be interpreted later on. It wasn't written with this interpretation in mind, but we can now look back and interpret it as a letter from um, Jesus to the church. We can see it as a letter from our bridegroom to his bride who is coming back for. There are different ways that we can now add a, a prophetic interpretation to it and that can be correct in terms of what we are reading but we cannot ascribe that prophetic interpretation to the person who originally wrote the book so that is just where we need to keep a balance in mind so we cannot say that this is definitely what was meant when the book was originally written because it wasn't solomon wasn't thinking of the eventual coming of jesus for his bride and um, he was very much living in the moment with all of his wives and concubines, but 
we now can look at it and realize that God allowed this to be added into, the Holy Spirit allowed this to be added into the canon of scripture so that he could speak to our hearts as the bride of Christ. So when we come to Solomon, to um, the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon chapter 5, if we read chapter 4 verse 16, uh, this is the, the bride or the Shulamite speaking to her, her bridegroom and she is saying, you have called me a garden, she said. Oh, I pray that the cold north wind and the soft south wind may blow upon my garden, that its spices may flow out in abundance for you in whom my soul delights. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat its choicest fruits. Now I want you to just in your mind, just have that verse in the back of your mind that she has said, you have called me a garden because in previous verses, he has referred to her as his garden of delight. And she is now saying "Let the cold north wind and the soft south wind blow upon my garden. Now, anybody who is a gardener, which I am not, uh, but anyone who is a gardener, a successful gardener, knows that we need all the seasons and we need all the different winds and rains and things to come to blow to get different plants to grow in different seasons and do different things. And so we have the cold north wind, we have the warm south wind and all those various things. In the Bible, when, we ref when the north wind is referred to, you will often um, hear talk or read in the Bible about the north wind, calling up the north wind, stirring up the north wind, awakening the north wind. The north wind refers always to a wind of adversity. You will read in Jeremiah 6 verse 16, or in Jeremiah chapter 6, which we have been focusing on Jeremiah 6 verse 16 and those surrounding verses about walking the eternal paths. God calls armies from the north. It's generally seen as adversity. So when the Shulamite calls for the cold north wind to blow, she is calling on this wind of adversity. And the soft south wind is generally this wind of kind of soft warmth and, you know, kind of a more um, gentle, but the cold north wind is a wind of adversity. This is kind of, if we think about it in our own context as individuals, it's when we pray things like, um, Jesus, break our hearts for what breaks yours. You know, Jesus, we give everything to you. Take everything that you want from us. When we pray things like this, like that, um, and we mean them, but we don't actually understand what we're saying. And often God takes us at our word, and then we don't always get what follows from that. But it's important for our walk through the fires of intimacy. And God uses our ignorance sometimes, not because he's a big cruel bully, but because when we pray those things, even in our ignorance, we are opening ourselves up to more of him. So how often do you say things like, I want more of you, God, I want more of you, but you have no idea how God is going to bring that more into your life. And we often assume that it's going to be all gentle and lovely and beautiful. But often the only way God can bring that more into your life is through the cold north wind, the winds of adversity. And that is how he brings you into covenantal alignment. That is how he walks you through the fire of intimacy. That is what we see in Song of Solomon chapter 5. So if we start from verse 2, she says, I'm reading from the Amplified, the amplified Version. This is the, the bride speaking, the Shulamite. I went to sleep, but my heart stayed awake. I dreamed that I heard the voice of my beloved as he knocked at the door of my mother's cottage. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my spotless one, he said, for I am wet with the heavy night dew, my hair is covered with it. Now I want you to notice here, because hear me, and remember I'm bringing all threads together for this new thing that we're stepping into as a global church, for this, these eternal paths that God is showing us that we need to be walking on. For the sound of the trumpet, I'm blowing the sound of the trumpet that it speaks about in Jeremiah 6 verse 17. So here we have this, this talk about him knocking on the door of his beloved. Now, according to some scholars, this is the only verse, the, uh, the only Old Testament commentary on Revelation 3 verse 20. Remember, we're talking, 
the churches in Revelation, the seven churches in Revelation, and what we learn about the new wineskin based on the seven churches in Revelation. And that will be the summation of all of this when we eventually get to the end of it because God keeps adding layers of revelation to it. But Revelation 3 verse 20, when Jesus is speaking to the church in Laodicea, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and listens to and heeds my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will eat with him and he will eat with me. Now, so often this verse is preached and quoted as being for an individual. Behold, he stands at the door and he knocks at the door of your heart. But this week, Jesus was speaking to the church of Laodicea. He was saying, I stand at the door and knock at the door of the church. Because he uses the singular in many of the other churches that he spoke to. He uses that singular, you know, the, he uses the he. He doesn't use, use the them in all of them. But he's speaking to the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm knocking at the door of my church. Will you open the door to me? And I think, you know, possibly never before can we say more with more clarity that Jesus is standing outside the church knocking. And I'm sure there have been many times, no, many times in church history, having just studied it, that Jesus has stood outside the door of the church and knocked actually. But right now, where we stand now with the global church in the state that it's in right now, I think we can say with great certainty that Jesus is standing outside knocking. So this is the, the Old Testament commentary verse for Revelation 3 verse 20 in Song of Solomon where it says, where she says, I dreamed that he knocked at the door and he says, open to me. But we move on to verse 3, but weary from a day in the vineyards, I had already sought my rest. I had put off my garment. How could I again put it on? I had washed my feet. How could I again soil them? What does she say to him? What does she think in her dream state? She thinks, I've already toiled all day in the vineyards. I've already taken off my garment. I've already washed my feet. And the cross reference in the Amplified takes us to Isaiah. Isaiah 32 verse 9. Isaiah 32 verse 9. Where it says this, ladies, rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my, Isaiah's voice, you confident and careless daughters, listen to what I am saying. And it goes on um, in, in verse 10 and 11 to speak about careless and complacent women and women who are at ease. When Isaiah was prophesi prophesying over the wealthy women in the city who thought that their futures were completely secure because they had everything they needed. They were complacent, they were at ease, they had riches, they had power, they had influence, they had affluence, they had need of nothing. And he was prophesying to them that within little more than a year, they would be shaken with anxiety because everything that they had would come to naught. But this verse, where she says this, what we can, what, so she has, she has asked for the cold wind, the cold north wind to blow upon her garden. She has prayed for more of God. If we look at this as a message from the bridegroom to the bride. And here the bridegroom comes and he says to her, I'm knocking at the door. And she says, what more do you want of me? And how often, let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen, how often do we say to God, Maybe not, we, maybe we don't say the words, but we think them or we feel them somewhere in the depths of our being. When God says to us, I need you to give this up. I need you to surrender this. I need you to give this. I need you to leave this. I need you to put this down. I need you to walk away from this. How often do we think to ourselves, 
How much more must I give? How much more must I sacrifice? How much more must I surrender? What more do you want from me, Lord? I've given everything. I've give, I gave my life to you. I've surrendered everything. I've walked away from the friends that aren't good for me. I left the partner that wasn't good for me. I've surrendered my children. I've surrendered my ministry. I've laid down my dreams. I've given up my vision. I've sold my house. I've moved from place to place. I'm rootless, transient. The world is a scary place. Nothing is certain anymore. I don't know what to do with what I have. Do I hold on to it? Do I leave it in the bank? Do I take it out and put it in my mattress? Do, you know, what more do you want from me, God? Have you not taken enough? Have I not surrendered enough? Have I not sacrificed enough? I don't think we often say those words out loud, but I think if we were absolutely authentic and vulnerable right now, we would admit that we have thought that or felt that. We might have squashed it down immediately that we crossed our brains or crossed our heart space, but we somewhere along the line, we have all asked, why me? Why me? Why am I sick? Why have I got this disease? Why is my child in this space? Why is my family struggling with this? Why are my finances under attack? Why me, Lord? I've done everything you've asked me to do. Graham Cook says that why me is the most pointless question we can ask because why not? Why not? Because when we say why me, what we're saying is why aren't you doing it to somebody else rather? Because I don't deserve it. Somebody else does. So what happens? She says to him, basically, have I not done enough? I just want to rest. I want to rest, Lord. I'm exhausted. I've already washed my feet, taken off my garment, done everything. I am weary. It says in verse 4, my beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door and my heart was moved for him. I rose up to open for my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid sweet scented myrrh which he had left upon the handles of the bolt. I opened for my beloved but my beloved had turned away and withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul went forth to find my soul went forth to him when he spoke, but it failed me, and now he was gone. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. There are times, ladies and gentlemen, when we walk through the fire of intimacy, when it feels as though God has withdrawn himself from us, where we cry out to him and he does not answer, where we search him, we seek for him and we cannot find him. And often in those times, we think that it's the enemy. We immediately step into our Christianese type formulaic mindset and we start to rebuke the plan of the enemy 
we start wondering whether we need deliverance, we start looking for if we have any secret sin in our lives, we start going through all of those things instead of wondering whether God is taking us through the fire of intimacy. Because sometimes, not sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, not sometimes, each and every one of us goes through stages in our lives where we have to pursue God. He doesn't go anywhere. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But we all walk through what the phrase that has been coined, the dark night of the soul, where we pursue God. Because we need to have our own Gethsemane moment. You know those moments that Jesus had in Gethsemane? Where he sweated blood? Where he cried out before God in his pain and in his suffering? Father, if it is possible that this cup could pass from me, and yet, if it is your will, I will do your will. Because he knew exactly what was to come. He knew exactly what was to follow. And each one of us, at some point in our lives, and for many of us at more than one point in our lives, we will have a Gethsemane moment where we have got to say to, the, to God, Whatever your will is. I have had moments where I have said to the Lord, I surrender my free will to you. I give it to you by choice. I use my free will to surrender it to you and let your will be done, Lord, no matter what that looks like and if you don't say that with fear and trembling then you don't know what that means you don't know what that means if you don't say that with fear and trembling it is but the only way that you know that you are covenantly aligned with God is if you have had a Gethsemane moment, if you have walked through the fires of intimacy and you know that no matter what, you will pursue God. Because many people, they reach, they get into that space where they can't hear God and they can't, they don't seem to find him. They're like, where are you, Lord? And they go through all the motions that we do as Christians and they blame the enemy and they think it's an assignment and all of those kinds of things. And then they just give up. They might not walk away from God. They might not stop being believers, but they just stay there. They just, they just stay there. They keep, they go through the motions of their Christian life. But they stay in that place. They never push through into pursuing God. Because the cost is too high. Because what happens next? Verse 7. The watchmen who go about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil and my mantle from me. What happens? She goes after him and the watchmen of the city find her. Who are those watchmen? The watchmen are the spiritual authority in the church, the governmental ministries in the body of Christ. Those are the watchmen. Those are the watchmen in this specific instance in chapter 5. In, in Song of Solomon Chapter 3, verse 2, the watchmen, those in spiritual authority and governmental ministries, help her find a place of deeper intimacy. But in chapter 5, she meets watchmen who are motivated not by a desire to protect and assist, but by fear and by jealousy. And instead of protecting her, they use their authority to 
to wound her, to accuse her, to blame her, to gossip about her, and to slander her. Because those of us who push through and search after Jesus, when we pursue him, when we walk through those fires of intimacy, we intimidate those who haven't. And what happens then is they are scared, they are fearful, they are jealous, and they come at us with accusation, with slander, with gossip, and they wound and they abuse their governmental authority, their power. <coughs> and again, we can blame that on the enemy. But God uses the adversity of the north wind to purify and refine us in the fire of intimacy. The fire of intimacy is a place where we sit at the feet of Jesus, absolutely. But it is also a place where we are refined. So it is not always a comfortable place. And it is a place where we find ourselves confronted by friends, by leaders who do not understand what we are walking through, but they are fearful and they are jealous and they are intimidated and they use their authority to wound and abuse rather than protect and assist. But what is her response to that? In verse 8, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I'm sick from love, simply sick to be with him. Her response is, I am love sick for Jesus, and nothing you can do to me is going to change that. What do they say, these daughters of Jerusalem? They say, what is your beloved more than another beloved? O oh, you fairest among women, taunted the ladies. What is your beloved more than another beloved that you should give us such a charge? What are they saying to him? Who is this beloved of yours and why is he worth more than any other beloved? Why would the daughters of Jerusalem or the other people around them say that? Because these people in verse 9, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 9, they have many beloveds apart from Jesus. Who are their other beloveds? Power, money, ministry, gifting, influence, affluence, status, spouse, children, family. They have many other beloveds. Jesus is not the one and only beloved because there are many believers in the body of Christ who do not serve Jesus and only Jesus. They think they do. They want to. But there are too many other things that they serve as well. Too many other things that are just as important, if not more important. They do not live their lives purely and simply for Jesus. But the remnant that is rising up out of the church as we know it are those who will have walked through the fire of intimacy and they serve only Jesus, not man, not religion, not anything else that is vaguely man-made, but only Jesus. Only Jesus. That is the new wineskin. When you serve only Jesus, Jesus, no matter what. And then she says, my beloved is fair and ruddy, the chief among 10,000. His head is as precious as the finest gold. His locks are curly and bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside the water brooks, bathed in milk and fitly set. And he goes, she goes on and on and on until the end of the chapter about how incredible her beloved is. 
that is the fire of intimacy. That is where we push through to eventually, where God is like, yes, my child, you have passed this test. You have walked through the adversity of the cold north wind blowing on your garden. And you are refined like gold and silver. This was what they faced in the New Testament times. If we look, touch very briefly on the book of Philemon, this, you had Philemon and Wansimus, a master and a slave. Both had come to know Jesus, both born again, both friends of Paul. But in the current, their current social climate on very different levels. Why? Now let's just one quick word. Slavery in those days was not the way we view it in the Western, in our Western culture. I'm, it's, I'm not saying it was better in any way, but it wasn't, we can't view it the way we view it through our Western mindset. The, the social construct and context of the days that Paul lived in were very different. When Paul speaks about freedom in his letters, their idea of freedom in those days was very different to our idea of freedom. We yell freedom for anything these days. Their idea of freedom was very different. F freedom the way we see it today would have been very scary for them then. Because to be free then, the way we see it today, would have meant that they had nothing. No food, no home, no nothing. To be completely free of everything then meant that you probably starved to death in a gutter somewhere. That wasn't what they aspired to at all. Slaves in those days could be doctors, could be lawyers, could be um, secretaries, could be taxmen, could be, it was very, very different in those days. So don't let your Western mindset impact the way you read the book, okay? But still, and the social construct, they had this whole patron client on a shame thing where everyone in society, every member of society owed something to someone. They, they were supported by someone above them, someone of greater influence. It was a very, very intricate, complicated setup. And that was the context within which these books were written, which is why we just take so much out of context in the New Testament, so much it is unfreaking believable. But Philemon and Wansima still had this issue where they were master and slave, but they were one in the body of Christ. And so here we have Paul trying to explain to them that even though in the world they had this, re this relationship, in Jesus, their covenant alignment, their relationship was like this. So in Jesus, they were covenantly aligned this way, even though in the world, their relationship was different. And Paul was not condoning slavery the way we see slavery, because he didn't know about slavery the way we see slavery. He understood it within his context. He was after what they called manumission in those days, which I'm not going to explain now. But what he was looking for was for Philemon and Wansimus to understand their covenantal alignment with Jesus and each other. And it is only when we have walked through the fire of intimacy with Jesus that we can truly understand intimacy and unity with each other. We have to walk through the fire of intimacy with Jesus. We have to have our Gethsemane moments with God before we can fully understand what it is like to be intimate and to, be, to have unity with each other. So that we are never those watchmen who accuse and gossip and slander because we are fearful and threatened and intimidated by those who are seeking more of God. In this month of Tammuz, ladies and gentlemen, 
Expect your intimacy to be challenged. Expect your intimacy to be tested. And don't be afraid. If this is not something to be fearful about. But be excited. Press in. Go after it. Because what is on the other side is more than you could ever, ever begin to imagine. God has more for you than you could ever, ever begin to imagine. As my friend Hilda loves to quote her favorite verse, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can, I can't think of all of it now, begin to imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Push through, push through, and be expectant for what God has for you. Right, we're going to leave that there this morning. And I am going to release a blessing right now for this journey that you're all going to take with God. It's going to be powerful. It is going to be powerful. So I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I shall see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend. Love you. See you next week.